welcome back to Taking Stock. It's been a, a long time, too long. Yes. Uh, I think we went into sort of pandemic hibernation or something, but we're back, uh, back out again. And uh, so uh, since our last Taking Stock, I think Bitcoin has gone or four to solidly five digits. So Bitcoin has been on a tear. I think a lot of the people who listen to Taking Stock want to know just the nuts and bolts of Bitcoin. Like, why should I care about this? Sure. Yeah. Bitcoin, it's been fascinating. I've been watching it. Uh, well, I did an economic update on it back in 2017. So I've kind of had my eye on this for a while. Um, the thing that's interesting about Bitcoin is probably back in 2017 or before that, there was always this you know, what is Bitcoin? How are people going to use blockchain technology? And there were really two camps with Bitcoin. One was, how can we make transactions um, immutable, right? Meaning that it's permanent. And how do we store value, right? And so there are these two camps. And with Bitcoin currently as it sits, people are viewing it as an inflation hedge, right? So we've had all this government stimulus money, uh, unemployment benefits, PVP, right? There's more cash in the system now than there was um, at the beginning of 2020. And people are viewing Bitcoin as synonymous with gold, right? The use case for sort of, are you going to pay pay for coffee? I think down at Olive, when Olive was open, you could pay for coffee with Bitcoin. That would have been a very expensive coffee. Um, I tried to one time, but they said that the, the iPad wasn't working. So lucky for you. Lucky for you, a um, fiat currency, right? But the the narrative behind that continues to gain steam, and so we've seen Tesla, Elon Musk, you know, purchase Bitcoin to own on Tesla's balance sheet. You can now buy a Tesla with Bitcoin, which I would strongly advise against because you know capital gains if you have uh, capital gains. But that narrative of a inflation hedge is gaining a ton of momentum and the supply of Bitcoin is known and fixed over time. Right. How so, many are there? Uh, at the moment, I want to say there's 18 million, but there were only there will only ever be 21 million, yeah. I believe is the, the exact number. Um, but now you see investment firms like JP Morgan, uh, Fidelity, investors are actually asking for allocations to Bitcoin where they would have previously maybe thought of gold, right? And so as that generational kind of transformation goes through, you could see, and we have seen, flows out of gold and into Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's pretty interesting. Well, it's interesting too, in my mind, just because it, uh, you know, we often hear people say, well, it's, I mean, what what is it? What do you mean? It's not even a thing. It's just like, it's just a big hoax. But I think the thing we always have to remember is that the thing that makes any currency work is that we all believe it's a store yeah. of value, that if I give you a dollar, it's worth a dollar. As long as a large enough group of people believe that is the case, well, then that is the case. Right. Cigarettes are, are currency in prison, right? Yeah. They, they have a totally different monetary sort of value. What you can get in exchange for cigarettes in prison is totally different. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk about your prison story in the next one. No, well, I have never been in prison. Um, but point being that, you know, really any asset works that way, right? A share of Tesla stock is worth what the last two people who traded it agreed it was worth on or right. agreed it was worth. Right. Um, so it, you know, back all the way up. Most people don't own physical shares of Tesla, right? And really, that's just a claim on the earnings of Tesla. Um, right. So. Yeah, pretty interesting stuff. But the inflation piece, you know, I know that you have a lot of thoughts on that. The government saw some stat. It was something like 20% of the dollars in circulation right now were created in 2020. Um, so can you talk a little bit on your thoughts on inflation? Yeah, in, 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 a, in an interesting way, it's linked so, uh, you know, to, to the currency piece we just talked about where, you know, you know, currencies have value when we believe they have value. Well, oftentimes we see inflation simply when people believe that there is inflation, right? Because it basically makes us willing to pay a higher price, right? And companies are always willing to raise their prices if we're willing to pay a little bit more for something. 
So increasingly, what we're seeing is that prices are prices are going up. And you know, as as horrible as this pandemic has been, you referenced all this government spending. Well, a lot of that government spending it went on to company and individual balance sheets. So right now, levels of wealth um, are you know fairly strong. Um, you know, and, and I mentioned this in the economic update: huge divergence of experience, right? Um, but for a lot of us, you know, who can, we kept our jobs, right? We weren't spending a lot of money. Savings has gone through the roof, you know. So, um, so that's a, a big part of it. There was some supply disruption, and we did see that. Um, and so we're starting to see that in prices. Um, I think you know I've been trying to buy a bicycle. Yeah. And I mean, this was an absolute saga. Right. I, and I, I desperately wanted to be, you know, to spend my dollars locally and buy it from Allegro Bike Barn. I went, neither had the bike that I was really looking for. And they were amazing to work with. They, you know, tried to get me the bike, but it just, it wasn't possible. So I ended up spending about twice what I would have liked to and ended up, you know, finding it online. Um, and I know Tyson Romanek, who's our other portfolio manager, um, he has a very, very depressed German Shepherd named Panzer, um, who is used to having this Kong chew toy. He said all dog owners would know what this thing is. He loves those things, and they just simply aren't available. Um, so we're going to see those supply, you know, issues. Um, lumber is another one. Um, yep. That's in the middle of time. Now. Yeah. Um, so in every single one of these things, if you dug down into whatever the good was. You know, there's some story about why there is that supply, you know, uh, problem. Um, and we're seeing it, you know, of course, with uh, with chips right now, uh, microchips and semiconductors. So, um, so you know, I, I think the bottom line is we may, the, the real question around inflation is, will it be persistent over time? You know, and there's all these forces that are causing prices to go up some forces that are you know were existing Great. beforehand right like technology and demographic trends one though that i think is softening a bit is this ability to outsource to a country with lower wages um and simply because the pandemic has taught us that having supply chains overseas is a little bit risky um, and there's just this i guess rising level of nationalism talking about having industrial economic policy where we bring things back home. Biden in his last speech was talking about, you know, build it in America. So yeah. I think that one, might be. One that was really interesting was the chip concept, right? So one component of a bunch of different goods. So I guess one of the hardest things for auto manufacturers to get right now is semiconductor chips mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. Taiwan Semiconductor. Well, I can't remember the dollar amount, but Biden, I wanted to say it was something like $40 billion to get Taiwan Semiconductor to build a plant in Arizona. And Intel is like redoing all of its, for the longest time, chip designers in the US would outsource the fabrication of those chips to Taiwan Semiconductor. Well, now there's this security risk, right? Because China really finds Taiwan interesting. And there's this kind of like, it's almost like semiconductors are the new oil. Right. Yeah. And there's sort of this national security, you know, I don't I don't know tech this well. Right. But sort of you don't want your biggest competitor controlling the chips that you put into your, you know, computers and defense right. equipment. Um, but it was really it was some astronomical number um, that Biden threw out to sort of bring. It wasn't just the bring bring the jobs back because of supply chains, but it was also like national security driven. Right. Um, so that that's one that I've been reading about quite a bit. Yeah, we talked about this too, sort of the balance between being resilient and being efficient. And there's always a tension there. And it yeah. seems like the trend now is to move more toward resilience, which means a little less efficient, which means, you know, from an inflation standpoint, you know, maybe a, a little bit less disinflationary, a little, you know, bring prices up a bit. You know, speaking of rising prices, I know that when we look at the stock market, um, there's a lot of people that look at sort of these elevated, you know, stock market levels and a lot of people point directly to Robinhood and say it's because of all these crazy retail traders. I know you've been following that and some of the sort of warning signs. Yeah, it, it's kind of interesting. I haven't figured out how to put it into a concise kind of article. But when you think of, 
you know, what sets the price of a stock? It's the last trade, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the very last trade. So if right now uh, you and I traded a share of Baker Boyer at $120, which I believe would be a premium of like $40, $45, um, that would reset the price for all the other shares, right? So with the uh, advent, and that's not advice on Baker Boyer stock, just to be totally clear, we're prohibited from doing that, just using that as an example. Um, but Robinhood has allowed people to do fractional share trading, uh-huh. right? And people with, so now instead of needing 700 odd dollars to buy a share of Tesla, you could put $40 into Tesla. And get a partial share. And get a partial share. And so that's increased the frequency or kind of the number of participants. And so that's what you see, it's a little more complicated with GameStop, but it's the same concept that you're getting repricing of those securities faster and faster so that the influence of many smaller participants is growing relative to larger dollars. Um, And Robinhood, you know, they, they've been under some serious scrutiny with the GameStop thing um, and some other developments. But one that I saw that was, I mean, it took me about five minutes to sort of think through how this happened, but there was a, he was in his early thirties and I think he was in Arizona. This was in Forbes and he called his CPA and he said, I think I've made a huge mistake. He created an $800,000 tax bill for himself, and he only netted $40,000. So he put $30,000 into a brokerage account with Robinhood. He borrowed against that, so he was able to, to sort of use leverage. So he turned that into 90. He ended the year with an account balance of 135, I think, so a net gain of 45,000. But his tax bill for generating that forty-five thousand was eight hundred thousand dollars, and he made thousands of transactions. So he was just buying and selling Tesla, buying and selling all of these different securities. And what he didn't know is there's a rule called the wash sale rule, and the wash sale rule says that basically any, I won't get into it here, but there's a thirty-day period where you can't sort of recognize a loss. If a stock went down by half, I can't just sell it and then rebuy the security. So they disallow that that loss. But what they do is they add it to your basis. And so basically what happened is he got every one of his gains counted against him on all of these transactions. But none of the losses. All the losses got put into his basis on that 140,000. So he has these huge basis numbers, but he didn't sell the stock. And so it showed him with, you know, I can't, I did the math, but it was something like $4 million in gains, but he had 40,000. Um, so, you know, just a word of caution for, you know, I don't think our our listeners or viewers, you know, it was something like he, he traded something like $46 million worth of securities. So he was a, he was so a- So the bottom guy. line is his solution would be now he's going to have to liquidate everything and realize that loss, but he won't be able to apply it until if he would have done that on the third that year now he can't go back in time and apply that loss he's on the hook um so you know pretty pretty crazy but you know my question for you and we've talked a lot about this with clients is that 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 concept of more participants rebidding prices for stocks leads to a phenomenon called momentum, right? And momentum, can you tell us a little bit more about that and kind of how we think about it? Sure, yeah. So momentum is uh, just an incredibly well-documented phenomenon in markets. And, you know, we see it, it it is, uh, it's across geographies, it goes across business cycles, but we see it's just so clearly in the data. And it's this idea of, a stock that is moving up in price tends to continue to move up in price. And the same is true on the way down. Um, And that's that's momentum. And the idea is that it goes up in price, maybe past some intrinsic value. Right. Mm -hmm. So and it's the idea that you were talking about when um, you have uh, a stock that's trading and it's going up that builds excitement about the stock. 
and it can tend, you know, there's a, you know, FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Other people want to jump in and start buying it. And so it bids it up. So you can actually, you can build strategies, investment strategies around this simply because it's so well documented. Um, the idea is that you want to do it in a really broad based, very systematic way, but to just capture this phenomenon of stocks going up. Now, what's interesting today is that they're, there are so many more market participants, you know, and therefore may, and, and this is something I think that remains to be seen, but as we go and we look back at momentum in the past and momentum of the present, will we find that this current momentum is more robust or a little stronger um, than it was in the past simply because of this market structure that you're talking about? Well, that, so, that sounds almost too simple. Just buy things that have gone up. There has to be, you know, there has to be more to it than that, right? There, there, there is. You know, one of the things is the quality of that momentum, right? Often you want to be, you want to measure: is it, is it, is it a line that's up that looks like this, or is it one that goes like this? Well, you want that higher quality momentum, the one that's steadier. And there's ways to measure that so that most of your investment in a momentum strategy is there. Um, the other piece of it is making sure that something is really exhibiting momentum over time. You know, there's ways to do that. The other key component to all of this is you, you have to be able to get out. Um, right. So you ride the momentum for a period, um, but the whole idea is that it's gone past some intrinsic value. So before it gets, you know, sold back down, then you want to exit that position. Um, but it, it is incredibly well documented and you know, is it stronger than it used to be? That remains to be seen, but it'll be interesting to find out. Yeah, I've always thought of it as more short term than value, but you'll often see val value and momentum or we read a paper a while ago, yeah. opposite sides of the same coin, right? Yeah. Value being sort of overestimating how bad things are and momentum being sort of the slow grind of overestimating how good things are. Value right. takes a lot longer to sort of show up momentum you just need to be able to get out before that sort of, uh, what do I want to say, the overprice or the the richness of the asset before it comes back to what it should be worth. Uh, uh, or value is sort of riding from discounted value to intrinsic and yep. momentum is going from intrinsic to above intrinsic. Both of them are viable ways to approach markets, but you have to do so systematically. If anyone's interested in talking about these things, we'll we're happy to, to discuss them. Well, I think that's all we've got for today. Um, yep. It was good to, to get a taking stock uh, out again. It was good to talk with you about all of this. Yeah, I enjoyed it. We'll try and do it more regularly. We won't have right. a, a hiatus. See you in a week? Uh, we'll see. Okay. That's more on your schedule. All right. Bye-bye. Right.